When it comes to the Mafia, one of the big names that comes to mind is Alphonse Gabriel Capone, better known as Al Capone, the greatest gangster in the United States. His story has been told in dozens of fictional films, television shows, books, and other media. It is an impressive collection for a man whose success in life were relatively brief. From punching his teacher in the face, through his years of attitude and leadership in the powerful Five Points Gang, breaking, entering, robbing, and even shooting a rival six times in the cheek in broad daylight at a crowded bar, we then learn the curious facts about Al Capone's life. The origins where it all began. Arriving weeks after the Great Blizzard of 1899, Alphonse Gabriel Capone was born on January 17th in one of the coldest years ever recorded in New York City. His parents, both Italian immigrants, were hardworking people living in Brooklyn. His father, Gabriele Capone, worked as a barber, and his mother, Teresina Raiola, worked as a seamstress. Of the nine children, Alphonse, nicknamed Al, became the leader once his mafia ties tightened. Two of his brothers, Salvatore, known as Frank, and Ralph, Bottles, Capone, worked for him in his criminal empire, while his brother James, ironically, became a prohibition agent in Nebraska. As a child, Capone was a promising student but struggled to adjust to the rules of the Catholic parochial school he attended. At the age of 14, he dropped out after being expelled for attacking and punching a teacher in the face. After leaving school, Capone had various odd jobs and joined several local gangs, including the Bowery Boys and the Junior 40 Thieves. Bored with simple break-ins and robberies, he set his sights on the powerful Five Points Gang in Manhattan. Capone earned the nickname Scarface. Landing a job at a local bar, he became the protege of the bartender, who was a mobster named Frankie Yale. It was during this gig that Capone earned the nickname Scarface after he accidentally insulted a woman while guarding the door. At one point, Galuccio leapt from his chair and charged at the security guard, Al Capone, who dared to insult his sister. In his hand was a sharp razor, and with three strikes he left visible scars on Capone's left cheek, a wound requiring over 40 stitches. From that moment, the young Al Capone would indeed be nicknamed Scarface. That ugly scar on his face wouldn't be enough to settle the matter between the two gangsters. Did he seek revenge? Find out how the story behind Al Capone's famous scar ends. Since then, he always tried to hide his scar and asked photographers to only take pictures of his right side, not the left, claiming that his injury was an old war wound. On December 30th, 1918, Capone married his girlfriend, who had given birth to their first child, Albert Francis Sonny Capone, a month earlier. Capone was 19 at that time, and his parents had to agree to the marriage. Capone became boss at 26. In a tactical move, Capone was ambushed. However, though unharmed, he was unable to work because he needed time to rest. Shortly after a week, in January 1925, Torrio was shot multiple times by a hitman while returning home from the mall. Although he survived the assassination attempt, Torrio was shaken and resigned from leadership, leaving the throne to Capone, who was only 26 years old when he became the new head of Chicago's largest criminal syndicate. Capone, already known to the public, realized he could profit from it and began to act like a modern-day Robin Hood, stealing from the rich and giving money to the poor. He opened a soup kitchen and shelters for the homeless and gave significant amounts of money as local donations. To protect himself, he befriended the mayor and the top administration of the Chicago Police Department. He was a regular in newspapers and was even touted as nearly a savior of the city. When he attended public events, such as baseball games, the crowd gave him standing ovations and the players would approach him to shake his hand. Capone was a genuine celebrity and used his power to strengthen himself in the city. He responded with more violence in an effort to take control of all the illegal breweries and transport networks coming from Canada. He was known to be a nice guy, the kind who would act like a presidential candidate, kissing babies during the day but at night would kill their parents while they slept. This kind of behavior translated into the way he ran his business. He would casually chat with local business owners with a smile, shaking hands, and offering his bootleg drinks. However, if they refused later that night, his henchmen would bomb the restaurant or bar. Over a single decade, more than a hundred people were killed in these crimes. And even though the citizens knew Capone was behind it, many only saw his smiling face and warm embrace. 
Impressive, Capone's personality, isn't it? Keep reading. Don't dare play with Capone. While Capone owned many scams in his youth, he now barely had any problems in his hands. However, when one of his accountants was caught by a rival, Joe Howard, Capone was determined to send the message, don't mess with Capone. So in broad daylight, Capone went after Howard in a crowded bar, greeted him, and then shot him six times in the cheek while keeping him seated at the bar. Once he was sure Howard was dead, he simply left. The bar was packed with people. Everyone saw what Capone did, and even the police knew it was him. Capone was questioned by the officers and left free, like any other man, without any arrest warrant. No one was willing to testify against him because, after all, you don't play with Capone. It's hard to believe that this level of illegality existed, but Capone built an empire where he was the absolute monarch. However, this kind of behavior also nurtured enemies. In a strategic plan to assassinate Capone, the Northside gang devised a strategy to lure him to the window at his headquarters at the Hawthorne Inn in Cicero. When he appeared, gunmen in several cars on the street opened fire with machine guns and shotguns. Somehow, despite the mass chaos, Capone survived with only a few scratches. He violently planned to distract Weiss, the mastermind behind the attempt, offering a truce that only lasted three weeks before he killed Weiss in the same spot where Dino Banyan was killed a few years earlier. Capone may no longer be with us, but he certainly left a great legacy for many followers and, in a way, is treated as an inspiration for many people who aspire to power today, whose personal motto is, don't mess with me. The Al Capone style. Al Capone was one of the gangsters who made history in the 1920s. He literally led in a bold way with luxurious suits and admirable leadership. The fashion, many are the photos where we can admire Capone's fashion pinstripe suits, fedora hats, and a cigarette in his mouth, all unique elements that characterize his attire. King Capone was the first swagger among gangsters of all time. Although today the term swag is used to symbolize the latest fashion style, if we look up the word in the dictionary, we will find that the first definition is loot or a large amount of money. Totally fitting for Al Capone, don't you think? What can we learn from Al Capone's gangster style, the car? When you are the biggest gangster during the Prohibition era in the 1920s and 1930s in Chicago, you need to take some precautions to protect yourself from police officers and fellow criminals who want to take you down from your throne. Known as the Al Capone Cadillac, it was the most famous of his cars. Capone's Cadillac was a 1928 town sedan 5.6 V8 and was considered one of the first cars to implement body armor and bulletproof glass. The car even has an urban myth surrounding it, supposedly F.D. Roosevelt, U.S. President from 1933 to 1945, used the car after Capone was imprisoned. The Secret Service needed a secure car to protect President Roosevelt, and Al Capone's Cadillac had the armor they needed. Did Al Capone and the President of the United States share the same armored Cadillac? The mansion in Miami. Certainly the number one gangster in the United States spared no detail in his house at 93 Palm Avenue. Still today, a refined luxury property of over 3,000 square meters. Built and decorated in white marble, with a large outdoor pool, wooden floors, and everything you would expect from a millionaire country house in Miami. A landmark of the Prohibition era, Capone's mansion is still one of the most famous and admired properties in all of Miami. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre. This corruption in Chicago politics continued until February 14, 1929, Valentine's Day in the United States. Capone, intent on ridding the city of the North Side Gang, ordered a hit on Bugs Moran, the only surviving member of the initial leadership. Capone supposedly instructed his men to rent an apartment across the street from a truck depot and garage that served as the Moran gang's headquarters. The space was used to conduct surveillance on Moran and his henchmen. On the morning of February 14th, Capone's lookouts gave the signal, and gunmen disguised as uniformed police officers raided Moran's building. The fake police lined up the seven men in the warehouse against a wall, claiming they were conducting a legitimate raid. Still lined up as ordered, Moran and his men were shot by gunmen armed with machine guns who entered from behind without the victims seeing them. Almost immediately, photos of the dead victims leaked to the press and Capone was held responsible for the massacre, ending his previously stellar public reputation. 
Within days, he was summoned to testify before a grand jury on violations of federal prohibition law, but he refused, claiming he was too ill to leave his Miami home. Knowing he could not avoid the subpoena for long, Capone testified before a grand jury on March 27, 1929. When he left the courtroom, he was arrested by FBI agents waiting for him, charged with contempt of court for pretending to be ill to avoid an earlier appearance. A team of federal agents known as the Untouchables, led by Elliot Ness of the U.S. Treasury Department, was tasked with taking down Capone and his syndicate. When Capone was sentenced in May of that year to buy time, Ness and his team increased their investigation of him while he was behind bars. Just a week after his release from prison in March 1930, Capone was listed as public enemy number one by the Chicago Crime Commission. With law enforcement on his heels and Elliot Ness refusing to back down, Capone was arrested less than a month later on vagrancy charges when he attempted to visit his Florida retreat. The governor, already alerted to Capone, ordered sheriffs to expel him from the city. Following suit, a politically ambitious Chicago judge issued a warrant for Capone and had him arrested in September on the same charges. Using this and his affiliation with the current Mayor Thompson, the judge used the publicity to run against Thompson in the Republican primary. In February 1931, Capone was again convicted of contempt of court and sentenced to six months, but he remained free because his lawyer appealed the conviction. Using legal loopholes, Capone waived his rights, citing profits from a criminal activity and the absence of tax and oversight. The Supreme Court ruled that the income should have been declared and that Capone's use of this loophole stretched the Fifth Amendment too far. The IRS authorized a task force to investigate Capone led by Frank J. Wilson. Since Capone owned no property in his name and had no bank account, Wilson focused on Capone's extravagant spending practices. Knowing that Capone could never pay for clothes, accessories, cars, jewelry, and cigars with his declared income, Wilson used his expenses as a way to prove Capone had falsified his income. Additionally, the IRS focused on key employees of Capone, including his brother Ralph, who was convicted of tax evasion in 1930 and served three years in prison. Was the problem in the family then? Capone had a highly acclaimed history, but unfortunately the bullet backfired. Did Al Capone manage to escape? Hoping to avoid a prison sentence, Capone ordered his lawyer to regularize his tax situation and through him made an offer to the government that he would declare his substantial income for specific years with an offer to pay income tax. Despite this, Al Capone was indicted for tax evasion in 1931, as well as several violations of the Prohibition Act. Judge James Herbert Wilkerson, who also presided over Ralph's case, was familiar with Capone and his antics. When prosecutor George E. Johnson agreed to a plea deal that would have given Capone only a couple of years in prison, the judge overruled it, refusing to allow Capone to plead guilty in hopes of receiving a reduced sentence. The judge ruled that he would not accept the guilty plea declared by Capone's lawyer, but only a personal confession from Capone himself. The judge admitted the personal confession as evidence, stating that anyone who makes a statement to the government does so at their own risk, including an authorized legal representative of Capone. The case began to be based on the size of Capone's income, using his spending habits as proof of his income. In November 1931, he was convicted of tax evasion and sentenced to 11 years in federal prison. Additionally, Judge Wilkerson fined him $50,000, plus an addition of $7,692 for court costs and more than $215,000 plus interest in back taxes. Shocked, Al Capone hired Washington-based lawyers specializing in taxation. They produced a writ of habeas corpus based on the Supreme Court ruling that since tax evasion was not fraud, Capone was convicted of charges related to years that were outside the statute of limitations for prosecution. Expecting the conviction to be overturned, Capone was surprised when the judge creatively interpreted the law, aiming for the time Capone had spent in Florida over the years to be subtracted from the age of the offenses. Thus, during that period, appeals were overturned. Movie The Untouchables, courtroom scene Al Capone, Robert De Niro versus Elliot Ness, Kevin Costner. Capone's era had ended. Once considered an acclaimed gangster, he found himself steeped in accusations, all of which he was fully guilty of. Are we sparking your interest? Follow us on social media so you don't miss anything. Al Capone arrives at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. In May 1932, at just 33 years old, Capone entered prison records when sentenced to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. When he arrived, he was in decline from cocaine use due to withdrawal. 
Sent to the infirmary, he was also diagnosed with syphilis and gonorrhea, in addition to having a perforated septum due to cocaine use. Weighing 113 kilograms, Capone was no longer the tough guy he once was, and was now seen by his peers as weak. Luckily for him, his cellmate was a former employee named Red Rudinsky, who took pity on Al Capone and became his protector in the facility. Other prisoners began to think Capone was receiving some kind of special treatment, and for his own safety, he was transferred to the newly opened and soon to be infamous Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. Stay at Alcatraz and Health Complications While at Alcatraz, Al Capone's health began to decline rapidly, and his neurosyphilis started compromising his mental stability. In the last year of his sentence, he spent most of his time in the prison infirmary, confused and mentally unstable. On January 6, 1939, Capone was released from Alcatraz and transferred to Terminal Island Federal Correctional Institution to serve his sentence for contempt of court. He was granted parole later that year on November 16th. Watch the video below and visit Al Capone's cell in Alcatraz. Still weak and tormented by his illness, Capone was sent to Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, which specialized in treating paralysis caused by the final stage of syphilis. However, upon his arrival, the hospital administration refused to treat him due to his reputation, and he was barred from using the facilities. The Union Memorial Hospital took him in and began caring for him. Grateful for their compassion and help, Capone donated two Japanese weeping cherry trees to the hospital. After a few weeks of treatment, Capone, still very ill, left Baltimore in March 1940 and went to Palm Island, Florida. The last moments of Al Capone. The disease had reached an advanced stage in Capone, so much so that doctors claimed in 1946 that he had the mental capacity of a 12-year-old child. Capone spent the last days of his life isolated at his retreat in Florida. On January 21, 1947, he suffered a severe stroke. Although he survived it, Capone contracted pneumonia during his recovery and had a heart attack just a few days later, on January 25, 1947. As a result of this heart attack, compounded by his other illnesses, Capone died at home, surrounded by his family. He was buried in Mount Carmel Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. Did Al Capone die wealthy? People tend to forget that most of the money generated by the gang belonged to the gang. Al took his share and spent it as fast as he could. The rest was distributed among the gang. Other funds went to bribes paid to police, judges, aldermen, and lawyers. The money was also used to upgrade equipment, trucks, etc. Al Capone's businesses had extremely high expenses. 